Hi, everybody. Thank you again for joining us today. Take a deep breath. <laughs> that, was, that was tough, but it's, it's the truth and it's reality and, and we need to learn it. My name's Mariana Davidovich. I'm the Director of External Relations at the Foundation for Economic Education. Sometimes we call it fee, and if you've never heard of fee, uh, we are one of the oldest free market think tanks in the world. We teach the legal, ethical, and economic principles of a free society. We are so fortunate to live in a country with freedom and individual liberty. The question is, how do we keep it? You may recall our keynote speaker last night, Pete Peterson, challenging you to soak in the history and have courage to understand the historical relevancy for what's happening today. Our next speaker exemplifies courage. She and her husband Felix and his mother Ida, they knew that there must be a better life than the one where they were struggling to survive in the USSR where not only did they suffer from the dire living conditions of Soviet socialism, but also persecution for being Jewish. Marina was merely a child herself, not much older than most of you in this room. Imagine risking everything for the small chance to leave the only home you ever knew, your family, your friends, Without any money, without a job, without language, connections, and not knowing where you were going, or if you'd ever see your parents, your sister, or your little brother ever again. And all the while trying to keep your little baby safe and fed. If it wasn't for her courage, I probably would not be standing here before you today. And of course, my children would not exist, and one of them is sitting in this room. So please, give me, let's give Marina Davidovich a warm welcome. She is my hero, my best friend, and my mother. Well, um, I just don't think I brought enough tissues for this because I wasn't ready for this introduction. Thank you so much. Um, victims of socialism. I personally don't consider myself a victim. I am a lucky one. I am blessed. Simply because I got to live in the country that is so dark and so built on lies, and yet it was my reality. And then I got into the wonder world of the United States of America, where the first time that I saw the supermarket and the department store, where you can actually go and buy shoes that fit your feet. So I have a luxury of comparing before and after, if you may. So I'm going to start with, you know, I, I have so many notes, and let me tell you, I was, I didn't know which way to go, how to do this presentation, so I'm just going whichever way it's gonna take me. We're going to start with the most important thing that human being needs is a shelter, correct? You need a shelter, otherwise you're homeless. Uh, we lived in a very tiny apartment. You cannot call it apartment, it was a basement. And the walls were always wet. And it was that when I was little, I would always touch the walls because they were wet, I didn't know why. My grandma and grandpa lived in a windowless little tiny room. There was only one bed and one chair. There was another room that had a windows that had only this much opening and we could see feet, people's feet walking by. And there was a little tiny kitchen, no running water, no indoor plumbing. 
Um, and this was normal, it was typical. Um, the carpet, the big rug that I remember, it was covering the wall, probably covering the black mold. And it was some kind of bed where my mom and dad slept. My sister and I slept on the cots that were pulled out and in, you know, at night in and in the morning out so we can have room to move around. Uh, because of that, because of black mold, I'm sure we had that, I didn't see it. I was very sickly. I was sick all the time. Uh, nurses in the in, um, hospital, um, they say, oh, you have your own bed with your name on it. I was, I had everything. And uh, the doctor said in order for, for me not to be so sick constantly, constantly, they had to uh, get rid of the um, uh, tonsils. They're called glands in, in Russian. Well, the wait was about six years, but the time I would probably die. So the only way to do it is to bribe the doctor, to give the doctor money. And that in that, my mom told me that they didn't have much money, so they brought him vodka and chocolate. And I was put in. It was very, very early in the morning. I was six years old. I still remember that horrible, horrible feeling. My mom was not there. They tied my hands and my feet. Um, and uh, they pretty much removed, you know, the tonsils and then, and oh, and they put the blindfolds in my eyes. And then they showed it to me and the doctor was laughing, look, you know, we really had to get rid of those. And which made me throw up and I was six. So that takes me a little bit away from what I want to talk about, shelter. But that tells you about the free socialized healthcare. And there was a question from one of you, what's wrong with the free healthcare? That's what's wrong. It is something that you, for the procedure that you need, you need to wait or you have to bribe if you have money. Um, and um, you have to wait, that, that's the basic thing. So let's go back to the shelter. At that time, it was a law that it's only six five or six, depending on the city where you live, five or six square meters per person. So that would be a family of four, that would be 24 square meters, and you can do a calculation what it is in the feet, you know, how many square feet will be per person. And that probably smaller than your living room, and that's a law. Now, we were lucky enough, we lived in the basement, but we were just our family. The rest of our neighbors were communal living, and it is all much fun. It is great. One family in each room, and they all have to be the using, and um, they live in the same kitchen, in the same bathroom, if they have indoor plumbing. Now, you might think, oh my God, this is so much fun to live together, it's just great. Well, ask your mom if she would be willing to share her stove. There was no refrigerators, by the way. If you're willing to share your stove or your, you know, cutting board or your knives with your neighbors, somebody that you don't even know. People were stabbing each other, they were rumor about each other. They couldn't wait for the neighbor to die so they could claim the door, the uh, room next door. It was terrible. It was absolutely terrible. In order to get the apartment, you have to wait in line. So you get on the list where place of your work. And for example, my husband worked at um, a plane uh, building factory. He was number 456, I think, or 465, I can't remember, which means about nine, 10 years to get an apartment. That's great. Um, it is another thing that is really important that nobody is talking about. It's called prapiska. This is something <laughs> so indignifying. It is, um, it takes everything out of your dignity as a human being. When you're 16, you receive a passport. And it's not a passport that we have here. It's a travel passport, and you need it in order to come back to the US. It's the ID. It's your national ID. In this ID, you have your name, your father's name, your last name, your date of birth, your nationality, and the place of your residency. They put the stamp. This is where you live. 
You cannot live anywhere else. And if you were here when Z was giving you an example saying that we couldn't even dream about traveling internationally, he's absolutely right. We couldn't move nationally and that's why, because of Prepiska. This is something that if you want to change your address, your stamp in your passport, you have to or get married and also have a consent of the head of the family to say, okay, let this husband bring his new wife. Or you go to college and you have temporary prepiska, which you have to go every year and confirm it into the police department. Well, it was called militia. It was, we didn't have police, we had militia. So this is something, imagine yourself that you live in Santa Barbara and you're like, huh, you know, I would like to go and try Texas. Well, you can't. You can't do this because if somebody will come and check and you live in different address than your passport, you get arrested and it's five to seven years in prison. Uh, the next thing, let's talk about food. It is something that you can't think about anything else when you're hungry. Anybody else here was hungry, but not hungry like, oh, I missed my lunch can't wait for dinner, but really hungry, like two days, have nothing to eat. I don't think so. Well, I have, and it is not pretty. You cannot think about anything. You just want to eat. You just want to have something. You want a bread. You want something to eat. Well, we, a lot of times, did not have food. Uh, when my brother was born, it was in 1960, he was born in November, my mom would wake me up 5.30 in the morning and bundle me up, it was really cold, and bundle up my brother, and we would go and stay in line. And because she needed me because they maybe would give us 10 eggs per person or one liter of milk per person, so she needed me to get more eggs, more butter, if they give, it was 100 grams of butter. And sometimes we would go and, sorry, there's nothing, or we would come and there's no more milk, or we would come and there's only two eggs left. So you go to the store and it's empty shelves, and it's not empty what we saw during COVID, like no toilet paper and no uh, sanitizers, and everybody's like, oh my God, that's it, end of the world. No, it's just empty shelves. There's no food. Come back tomorrow, maybe. If you walk down the street and you see the line, any line, you get in line. Why do you get in line? They might give something. It could be shoes, it could be coats, it could be frozen chicken, it could be, we don't know. You get in line. And when you get and say, and you ask like, what do they give, what do they give? And say, we don't know, we don't know. So by the time you get there, say shoes, size 39. Oh, but I need 36, you buy it anyway. You just get it anyway, it doesn't matter what it is. So we always had a little bag that is just folded up and it's called avoska, which means maybe. Maybe they'll give something, so we have this just in case. Uh, there's so many notes, I don't even know which way to go first. But it wasn't true for everybody. You know when they said socialism, it's all equal? It's great, right? It sounds so good, it's so appealing, especially to you young people who are equal. Well, it's not true. Socialism is not equality. There's two classes, two social classes, very distinct, and I have experienced, and I saw it with my own eyes. There's elites, which is government, and those that have really strong connections to the government, and then the rest of us. And the rest of us, there are two different types, the ones that live in the city and the ones that live in the country, the peasants. They had it even worse. And they, if I'll have time, I'll get to that, even worse than we were. So my friend, well, she wasn't my friend later, she was um, my classmate. We were together to school from first grade to 10th grade, Olga Banit. Her father was a, one of the local government, and she always needed tutoring in chemistry and physics, and I was great at chemistry and physics. And I would go to her home to help her with homework before I ran to my gymnastics. I would come in and i say, something rubbed me wrong. First of all, the building. It's a six-story beautiful building, big windows, big high ceilings, refrigerator, full of food. 
Um, and I would ask my mom, how come? What's going on? Why do they have food? Why do they have watermelon? And we don't. Why do they eat? Well, you probably will say, ooh, gross. Rabbit. Oh, so good. Yeah, they had rabbit. And her grandmother was always annoyed when I would come because it would come from school and we were hungry and she had to feed me. And she was annoyed, I could tell, but I didn't care. I ate. They had a lot of food. Everything was delicious. And I was asking my mom and my dad, why, what's going on? Because we taught in school, we're all equal. We're all equal. No, we're not. And then one, uh, one day, I um, tore a ligament in my ankle. And in order for me to get an x-ray to see exactly what was wrong, it took probably, they said, it will take about a month, four, four to six weeks. And she said, oh, don't worry about it. My sister just sprained her hand, and they did an x-ray immediately. I'll take you to that clinic. I'm like, what? You don't go to this clinic? And she says, no, 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 we have different clinic. So we're walking, and I'm humbling down, and it's a nice place that I never noticed before. We go in and it's beautiful, it's clean, and people are smiling, which is very unusual. They're, yes, how can we help you? And she says, well, my friend here, she has uh, something wrong with her foot. She needs an x-ray. She says, of course, of course, what's your name? She took the name and then she says, and what is your name? I said, well, Marina Fleet. And they said, oh, sweetheart, this is wrong clinic for you. I said, what do you mean it's wrong clinic for you? And even my friend Olga was shocked. She didn't know, but there's two different classes. They have their own stores where you can go and shop anywhere you want, from clothes to food to shoes. They have their own health care. They have their own, uh, they have cars. So don't be fooled. Socialism in, is not equality. It is definitely two different social levels. Um, it is something that um, you know, I would like to tell you just one little story. I was not the brave one in our family. I was scared to death. I did not want to leave. We even separated when we were, when I was dating my future husband, we separated because I said, I'm not going to go. I don't know where we're going to go. I know it's not ideal here, but I'm going to college. My mom, dad, everybody, I can't. So we separated for the whole three hours. He came back and he said, Okay, we're not going to go. We got married, we had a little baby, and we all lived in the communal um, apartment. His mom, his, her ex-husband, and we shared the kitchen and the bathroom. We did have indoor plumbing. Um, and uh, the, <laughs> the apartment was just rebuilt. They, they had a major... Um, renovation. There was just major renovation, so we could even smell the new paint. Uh, we, the, there was a long hallway, and then they turned to the kitchen. I was making dinner, and I put the baby on the little sofa that was right so I could keep an eye on her right there. And my husband came from work and picked her up to say, you know, hi, and he comes to the kitchen. He didn't even get to the kitchen when the big, huge plaster, piece of plaster just fell down where uh, she was. She was there like maybe 30 seconds before. And that shocked me. And I said, you know what? Let's do it. Let's get out of here because I see absolutely no light at the end of this tunnel. So that is probably what prompted me to say, okay, we're gonna take a leap of faith. We're gonna risk, we're gonna go. We didn't know where we're gonna go. So I'm being motioned and I have five minutes left and I have about five more hours of stories to tell you, but I'm going to um, just give you one more story. So from Kiev, from capital of Ukraine, we flew to Vienna. And the whole process of getting an uh, exit visa, that's another story. That is, if we would be refused, we would be called refuseniks, which means you have no place to live, no place to work. You are pretty much a dead man. So we did take that risk. Um, but luckily, we were given permission. We were given exit visa. And we came, our first stop was Vienna. 
So we came to this airport in Vienna, and I have to go to the bathroom with the baby because we did not have diapers, so I rushed to the bathroom, and I was shocked. It's the bathroom with mirrors and white floors and the toilet paper. I was shocked. So you know what I did? I rolled the toilet paper on my hand because, you know, you may never get it again. I came out, there was another, about six, I think six families with us. I said, you guys, you have to go check out this bathroom. That was my first hello to the Western world. And um, do I have two more minutes? Oh, three more minutes. So this one's shocking as well. Um, the next morning, so we spent a night, we stayed in the Pansion Batina. We spent the night there and uh, the organization, it's called HIAS, they're the one that sponsored us. They were giving us some money, and I didn't know what it money means, this shillings, we didn't know how to translate it into the what we can buy. And uh, I was running out of the crackers and I had a little thermos with milk and I am I am terrified what I'm going to feed the baby when she wakes up. So my husband comes in and he says, you have to see it. You have to see it. Um, the family that came about a week before us, they already kind of investigated and they found a supermarket called Leo and they took us there. So my first meeting with a supermarket, I think I was in shock for about 10 minutes. I couldn't move. The smells, the sights, and the um, abundance of, of products, it was shocking. I was truly Alice in Wonderland. And that's why I am, um, you know, I think 20 years of my life, I'm trying not to forget. That's why I always think that I'm 20 years younger because my life started when I came to the US. And um, I would like to finish with how blessed I am because I can see and compare. I can help it, but I still do everything, you know, that way it was before and the way it is in this country. And I really, really want to keep it the way this country is, the way it was in 1976 when I came here into the States. So thank you for your attention. And um, I'm sure you're going to have some questions. I'll be around the rest of the day. Please feel free to come. I have some pictures if you would like to see. I'll be more than happy to answer more questions from you if you have any. So thank you so much. And I think George is ready to take over the mic. Um, and I did not do the napkins. Thank you. Thank you, Marina. Uh, that was quite moving. You'll have an opportunity to ask Marina and our second uh, guest today questions after uh, Saren's uh, presentation. So, and then afterwards also on an informal basis. So the lecture that I delivered to you earlier today was first created in 2016 at the request of a YAF student leader for delivery at a YAF conference he was hosting at the University of California, Riverside. At the conclusion of that lecture, I was, as I was mingling with the audience, I was approached by a woman whose eyes glistened with tears. And she thanked me for telling the tragic story of her country, Cambodia, and she proceeded to tell me the story of her and her family's horrifying experiences living under Pol Pot and his Khmer Rouge henchmen. What she told me impacted me to my core. It became the impetus of my desire to deliver the lecture to as many college and high school students as possible. Adding to the emotion of the moment was learning that this woman was the mother of the student who had asked me to create and deliver the lecture. <clears throat> I never forgot this woman, nor her horrifying account of life in Cambodia under the Khmer Rouge. Her face flashed into my mind every time I stepped to the podium to deliver the lecture. This vision helped assuage any nervousness I might be otherwise be experiencing, for this nervousness paled in comparison to the true terror she actually experienced as a little girl. But at today's lecture, there was no need to conjure up her face from the recesses of my memory, because today this woman was sitting here amongst us. 
Ladies and gentlemen, it is my complete pleasure and total honor to introduce Saren Ath. Saren is a retired children's social worker, a proud mother and grandmother, and a survivor, survivor of Pol Pot's evil and catastrophic experiment in socialism. Come on up, Saren. So I'm going to uh, kind of ask some questions of Saren and she'll respond. Sure. So Saren, what was your family life prior to Pol Pot's takeover of Cambodia? Um, our life was so happy. We had a very happy family, was normal, just like you guys here. We had everything. We had freedom and we can do whatever we want without being controlled by the government. And um, at the time, I was a child, you know, around 12 years old. I went to school. I spent time with my friend, spent time with my family, going to see a movie, eating out, having a lot, lot of fun. You know, my family, we not that rich, and we not poor either. We are working class family. My dad worked very hard. He's a small business owner. He owned like a small shop, like furniture shop, and he used like, um, deliver um, furniture to different parts of the town in Cambodia. And my mom, see a stay-at-home mom to raise us. Saren, when did you first realize that ominous events were about to take place in your country? Well, at the time, like I said, I was a 12-year-old child. I had no clue of what about to happen. At the time, my parents told me and my sibling that we had to get out of the city. And the Khmer Rouge, they said that, you know, we have like only like the most like three days to get out. And they said, oh, not to worry. You know, you're going to come back. You don't need to bring anything. And they lied to us. We never, come, we never come back. So at the time, my parents just said, okay, just take a pair of your clothes and just a little thing to eat on the way. So that's what we had, a pair of clothes on our back. And my dad, he uh, carried food on his shoulder you know, enough food for a couple of days to feed all of us. So on the way, um, you know, we're not allowed to live in the city. We had to um, move to the countryside, to the real rural area. So we walked on foot for about two days. And on the way, I saw like uh, the elderly, disabled, severely sick people, and small children could not continue their journey and um, they were left to die on the street. At the time, I asked my dad, my mom, mom, that can we help them out? Can we do something? And he said, no, kid, you have to move on. Otherwise, we're going to be killed. So what happened to you and your family right after the Khmer Rouge took control of Cambodia? Um, we had no freedom. School, religion, hospital, shopping, business were all abolished. Money, what's left? You don't use money to buy anything anymore. And um, the Khmer Rouge, you know, the communists, they did not allow us to live as a family. They separate children from their parents. So my family, a big family. I have um, one older brother, two older sisters, three younger sisters, and um, one younger brother. So total like 10 people in my family. So we all were placed separately in a labor camp, according to our age group. And we all were forced to work in a labor camp. And as I remember, you know, I used to work like before sunrise. You're talking probably around four or five in the morning until sunset. And um, I had no food to eat. The government, they provide a food, you know, twice a day, lunch and dinner. There was no breakfast. There was no snack in between. So every lunch time and dinner time, the Khmer Rouge would ring the bell, right? So we had to rush from the field, from the labor camp, to the dining hall to line up for food. And you know what they give us? Like a small bowl, a few grains of rice in the, in the water. That's what no real food. And that's what we got. And for those who could not make it to the dining hall, they had no food to eat for that day. And um, 
many, many children my age or older, they were, you know, they died from starvation, exhaustion, and disease. That including my two younger sister. I have a um, five years old and a four months old staying at home. The Khmer Rouge did not allow my mom to take care of them. They were, you know, their intention left them to die at home. They let the five year old took care of the four months old. What the five years old know? So my mom, they allowed my mom only to come home like in the late evening to see them. So one day my mom came home, my five year old sister, she was lying on the floor, could not move, unable to move. So my mom picked her up, put in her arm, and asked her what happens. And you know, she could not talk. She had tears in her eye. And my mom knew that you know, she could not make it. So my mom told her, you know, go in peace. You will be with God. And there will be no more suffering for you. And my five-year-old, she understood, you know, she still had the capacity to understand at the time. She nodded her head in agreement with my mom and her tear flowing down from her eyes. And then she looked straight in my mom's eyes and um, took her last breath. And then she closed her eyes forever. My four-month-old baby sister also died in my mom's arm. No milk, you know, the four month old needed milk. And, um, you know, she had nothing, she couldn't even cry. Even she cried, you know, she tried to open her mouth, she cannot hear the sound or anything. So she died, my mom, she cried and cried. And um, until this day, you know, my mom's almost 100 years old now, she's like 95, 96. So she told this story to my children. I have two children, one boy, one girl, and the boy that George was mentioned earlier. So my mom told a story to my children every time she tell a story, she cry. And she told my children, saying that, you know, you guys are so blessed and so lucky to be in this country. And my mom told them, you know, this is the greatest country in the world on earth. So what I want you guys to do, try to preserve it try to fight for freedom so no one can steal you away. And um, she said, just stand up and fight because you don't want this great country to be like Cambodia. And my two children now all grown up, I have 28 and 21 years old. They are super conservative and they also the, um, you know, activists for freedom. So one other question here. Uh, what happened to you and your family while you lived in the collective? You talked a little bit about it, but some other experiences, Saren? Yes, I do. Um, you know, like collective, right? Like you also mentioned from the beginning of his speech too. Everything belonged to the government. You know, they call Anka. So you're not allowed to own any property. Um, you're not allowed even to own your own food because everything belongs to the government. If you dare to express your opinion, to criticize the government, they will execute you. So the Khmer Rouge kill intellectual people, like lawyers, doctor, teacher, student, journalists, the people who are uh, successful in business, and the people who live in a big city. They said those people are the enemy of the poor because they want to be everybody to be equal. And as I remember at the time, you know, for a girl or a woman, um, we had to cut our hair, you know, around shoulder length of this length. You cannot have any other style. And all the clothes that they provide is all in black. You cannot wear any color clothes. And um, at the time, my dad, you know, he's a good dad, a very caring dad, very loving. Even though he was starving to death himself, 
he tried to sneak out from the labor camp to find food for us. So what he did, he tried to find fish, snail, wild vegetable that grow in the field so that if I get a chance to visit my mom, because usually, you know, like at lunchtime, I would skip my lunch, sneak out to visit my dad or my mom. And I was lucky at the time they never uh, caught me. If I get caught, I would be killed too. So my dad, you know, they caught him and they arrested him for doing all that thing, for finding food for us. And um, they tied his hand to his back and the gun was pointed to his head. And they paraded him in the labor camp. And so paraded him on the street too. And they made announcement. They said, you see, that entire the government. He stole food from the government. So if you guys dare to do that, you would be executed. You know, for me as a young child, I love my dad so much. He's a really family man, a good dad. I was screaming and crying. And they said that, why are you crying? Why are you screaming? I killed the enemy. That's the enemy of the government. And that's your enemy too. That's not your father. That's the enemy. So if you don't stop crying, if you don't stop screaming, they're going to kill me too. And you know, like I said, no freedom even to grieve to cry. So I had to hold my emotion. And that was the last time I saw my father. And my mom, until this day, you know, at the time she was still young, in her early 15, all that too. She never remarried. She still stay very faithful to my dad and to the children. Without her, I would not be in this country. Do you want to talk about how you got out of Cambodia? Yes. Um, at the time, we had the opportunity, I think around 1979, something like George said, you know, like... Um, at the time, the Vietnamese um, military invaded Cambodia. And my mom and, you know, the rest of sibling, we gone through so much. So we did not want to live under the communist or socialist country anymore. So my mom was so strong, such a strong woman, very courageous. We had to escape from Cambodia and walk along to, um, you know, in a jungle toward the um, refugee, uh, refugee camp in Thailand. So we walked like um, about three days and three nights barefoot. Um, and in a jungle, there's a minefield. So you had to follow the same footstep. And you miss a step, you would be explode and die. I saw many people die from stepping on the minefield. And, you know, I was... A, young kids too, was so exhausted, you know, walking two or three days and not enough food to eat. And I want to rest, I want to spend at least a night somewhere in a jungle. So my mom, she found like a cemetery. And she said, okay, cemetery is a safety place to sleep because no one gonna put a bomb there, right? So we slept on the grave. And after that, you know, the next morning we, we like walking, walking again. And at one night, because like we could not see, and like mine for almost everywhere. And they say that, okay, the only safe place you had to cross the river. And I remember we did cross the river, the river up to my neck. My mom like holding hand, left and right, walk us, you know, to the dry ground. And finally we reached the um, refugee camp in Thailand at the border. And at the border, at the time, you know, the uh, Vietnamese um, military and the Khmer, I think they were still fighting and that bomb drop every single day at that camp. And we had to run around again, you know, try to navigate, you know, not to get, you know, bum. So the United Nations and I think the Red Cross too, they moved us to a better camp. So we were safe at a better camp, awaiting to come to the United States to find a sponsor. So what advice can you give to the young people in this audience in the United States about the reality of socialism? You know, socialism, communism, whatever you want to call. It's an evil ideology, pure evil, pure insanity. Pol Pot, the uh, Khmer Rouge leader at the time, he was educated in France. He learned about socialism from European philosopher and writing. Don't let the left fool you when they say, oh, democratic socialism is different. 
I live with, I witness it firsthand when you lose your freedom. So please don't take it lightly. You are, you all are the future of our country. Keep fighting for America. Keep fighting here. Because if you don't, we will head down to the same path. So we're going to um, let you ask questions of these two heroes. Come on up, Marina. Students, if you have a question, please raise your hand, and I'll bring you the microphone. Um, uh, forgive me. I one second. Sorry about this, uh, Marina. Um, I heard that um, your family is Jewish. What do you think of the current economic system in Israel? Uh, it's somewhat of a socialist hybrid. Um, and during the pandemic, they did limit a lot of freedoms. If you left within a mile radius of your home, you were arrested, which is a little scary to hear from yeah. back in uh, the US. Um, when we, so when we went, can you hear me? When we left the country, when we left the Ukraine or USSR, um, the reason we left, because thanks to Gerald Ford and Kissinger, because they opened just a little tiny crack that Jewish people could leave. And uh, we had an invitation to go and unite with a family in Israel. Um, when we came to Vienna, we were asked, all six families were asked, do you want to go to Israel or you want to go to other countries? And the reason we chose the other country, we didn't know which one, where, what, is because the letters that we received from um, people that left before us, they were saying, if you have a choice, don't go to Israel. It is much better than Ukraine, but it is still socialism. They give you apartment, they give you appliances, but then you are a slave forever and you can't leave. So that was the reason that we left and we went to the other countries. We didn't know we we're gonna go to the US or Canada, Australia, those three countries that were accepting Jews at that time. What's happening now, it is a sign that socialism under any pretense, it is not, it's, it's, they take your freedoms away. Once you have no choice, that's already, it's a crime. So what's happening there, there is a big internal fight between Hasidic Jews and the government, and um, the, the you know, people are pretty much going with that because they have no choice. And it is real hard to leave Israel, by the way. It is, it is difficult, you need to have a lot of money to actually leave Israel because you own the country so much, you own the government so much. So, but I don't know the details. I am, you know, I'm not there, I'm here. So, <laughs> thank God. Um, my name is Sarah, I'm from Buchanan High School. I actually have a question for both of you. Um, Mrs. Davidovich, um, how long after you, how long from like when you left Russia, how long did it take to get to the United States? Well, it wasn't Russia, it was Ukraine, but at that time the country was the USSR. You know what it stands for, right? Anybody knows? Union of Soviet Socialist Republic. Uh, when I came to the States, I just talked to somebody and I said, people would say, oh, where's this accent from? And I said, oh, USSR. What's the USSR? I said, well, Soviet Union. What Soviet Union is something there in UK? I said, no, 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 it's Russia. So everybody knew Russia. But we came from Ukraine. So when we applied for exit visa, it took us about a um, year and a half to get a permission to leave USSR. Then we went to Vienna, we stayed there for two weeks. From Vienna we took a train, which was horrendous. It was really difficult. It was one of the most difficult times of my life when we took the train from Vienna to Rome. In Rome we stayed six months and we 
uh, our dossier was sent to all different Jewish communities in Canada. By the way, we refused to go to Canada because we didn't have enough money. We had to pay. We had no money. So the, um, it took six months for Hartford Jewish community to accept our family. So when we came, we were greeted with um, warmth and hospitality that I have never known before, and I could not understand how people that don't know us, they brought us to our apartment. There was a kitchen, there was a refrigerator full of food. They even have meal already ready for us. Why, why are they so kind? There is no reason why. This is what American people are. They give because they can, because they want. And uh, there's a big difference when government says, give me, or when people are willing to share. So I witnessed a real true compassion and love. And my, I remember every single name of the people that helped me, Marsha, Jennifer, um, Diane, Sharon, Evelyn, they were my family. They taught me how to speak, how to shop, how to bank. I didn't know how to bank. There was no way. Like, what? I can write down on the paper how much I give you? Well, how do you know? Like, I could not understand any of that. So they taught me everything. Um, so did I answer the question? <laughs> I did. Sarah, yeah, it took that, that long. <laughs> Okay, yeah. <laughs> Thank Go you, ahead, Mrs. Sir. Davidovich. Um, Mrs. Ath, um, how long were you in the labor camps and how long did it take after you escaped to get to the U.S.? Um, I was in a labor camp for almost four years. And um, I was in a refugee camp for about two years. So I was there in 1979. And then we had a sponsor here in the United States so I arrived here in 1981. Again, just like uh, Marina just mentioned earlier. So, you know, coming out from such a horrible thing and um, what they did, you know, the sponsor thought of everything, how to go grocery, how to use the bathroom, how to cook in the stove, because, you know, for four years, I never had a young child, did not know how to do anything. It's just like back to like primitive way, you know like the old, old way. So here, like, everything's just so modern, so nice. And like um, Marina just mentioned, too, American people, they are so soft, they're so compassionate, so understanding. They help us, help us a lot. And that's why, you know, with my career and my whole family, we want to give back to this country. And that's why I was in the social work field. And my kid, my husband, worked in Department of Defense also. We want to protect this country to make sure that nothing ever happened like that again in here. Hi, my name is Danny, and I'm from Fresno, California. My question is for Marina. I was wondering, you mentioned going to school in Ukraine. Did you speak Russian in school? And if you did, how did that make you feel? Not be able to speak Ukrainian. Oh, that is, I hear a little Russian accent there because you, you call my name. <laughs> your first language is Russian. Uh, this is a great question. And I'm sorry, what's your name again? Daniela. Daniela. This is a great question. So we lived in the Republic of Ukraine. So you might think that, yes, we should speak Ukrainian, we should sing Ukrainian songs, we should eat Ukrainian food. No. Everything was Russian. Ukrainian was one of the subjects in school. It did make me feel, you know, this is the way it is. I did not feel like, oh, I want to feel Ukrainian. No. But in my passport, when I was 16, I was Jewish. Why am I Jewish? Uh, I don't know any, you know, Jewish traditions or religion. Or any, why am I Jewish and why am I being so outcast? How are you different? for me, that you live together with me, but you're Ukrainian and I'm Jewish. That was bothered me. When you go to library, in your library card, it says Jewish, and they look at you different. I didn't, go to, I didn't get to college, and I was an A student. I didn't get to college because I was Jewish, and I was a female. 
and they told me that way. They said, you know, you passed all the exams, you got into your qualifying score, but unfortunately we, we filled the quota of 3% of Jews and 3% of females. Like, uh, but we're all equal, right? Mm -hmm. Russian was pushed everywhere, in Latvia, in Litva, in Lithuania, where Z is from, Poland, Czech. When I was started training <clears throat> gymnast and I traveled the world with the national team, we went to Prague and we went to this beautiful restaurant and they said, we are so proud. We have menus on seven different languages. And I said, oh, can I have Russian? No. They hated Russians because they pushed it. They, they invaded it. So no, I did not feel anything because Russian was the language. I understand Ukrainian but I don't speak it. Like, I will understand when people speak Ukrainian, but I don't speak Ukrainian. It's Russian, so that's, that's what it is. They force it into you. Uh, hi, my name is Jacob Merrill, um, and I have a question about, I was gonna ask you guys, um, is, was there any like extracurricular activities that you were allowed to do, or is it just like very strict, or, yeah? Do an answer? Oh, yeah. Um, at the time, there, is no, there was no other extracurricular activity, so just strictly work in a labor camp from sun, you know, before sunrise till sunset, that was all. Um, we had a lot of extracurriculum. Like, for example, myself, I was um, learning how to play piano. It was after school activity. But then uh, my PE teacher took about 10 girls into the, uh, it's called Dessa Shah, which means uh, youth sports center. And they check you out which sport you will be good at. And they picked me for gymnastics. Somebody else was for swimming. Somebody else for sport, fencing. As you, I don't know, you were very, very young. But Soviet Union was, it was pride. And the face of Soviet Union was the top athletes. They were always the best. The gymnasts, the um, uh, fencers, divers, always the best. The arts were always the best. The Bolshoi Theater is, is famous. So this was the face of the Soviet Union. That's why the extracurriculum was very well, um, it, you know, it, it, it was there. You had to do it, but you didn't have a choice. You were told what to do. And when my coach would be mad at me, she said, you go play tennis because you're no good at gymnastics. So you would, they would check you out and say basketball, fencing. Well, I don't like fencing, fencing. So yes, extracurriculum was there. I, for example, I started doing ballroom dancing, but I had to quit because I didn't have shoes of my size and it hurt my feet, so I had to quit that. Um, and speaking of it, just a little bit off note, every time when um, Bolshoi Theater, for example, or the sports delegation would go abroad, it doesn't matter where, but mostly to the Western country, there was always, for every three, participant, there would be one KGB agent. Why? They were afraid that people are going to defect, and people did defect. I would recommend for you to watch the movie Moscow and the Hudson. If anybody, it's an old movie with Robin Williams. You probably don't even know who that is. But oh, you do? <laughs> so it is, it's defector. People were using any chance they could to escape socialism. That's how good it is. So yes, if I answer your question. Um, my name is Joshua Bailey. I'm from San Inez High School, and I was wondering, what was what was life like before, and how, about how long did it take for your country to fall into socialism? Uh, are you asking me? Both. You know, at the time I was a child, I was like 12 years old. So um, all I remember, the um, communists took over the country in 1975. 
And then it ended around like um, 1979 when the Vietnamese um, military invaded Cambodia. The, um, the question you ask is very complicated. It's a history lesson which we don't have time for, and I, I beg of you to look into it. So um, the revolution, October Revolution, happened with Lenin coming from Switzerland, actually. And the revolution was, in 1917, it was sponsored by uh, German money. And the name Purvis, I don't know if you ever heard, if you're interested in history, you could look it up. He's the one that came to German government and said, hey, if you want to stop this war World War I, if you want to stop it, you have to sponsor this person. His name is Lenin. His real name is actually Ulyanov Lenin. And he is going to help. So they helped with purchasing the guns and the read material. And um, so the revolution happened uh, in 1917. It was very easy because majority, this, the Tsar at that time was at the war. And uh, the Winter Palace was actually not attended. It was the Junkers, which they're young kids, 16, 17 year old, were just standing there. So the Bolsheviks came and they took over. But it is, it's a simple way of ex explaining. So in, in Soviet Union became Soviet Union in 1918, actually. It was the temporary government at that time. And I don't, the, the Tsar and his whole family, all his children, his wife, everybody was killed. They were shot. Um, so the, it didn't take slow and low and quiet. No, it just turned. It turned into the Soviet Union really quick. And uh, the people that came to power, they were bloodthirsty. And the, one of the uh, things that Stalin said in his one of the telegrams, he said, it's OK to kill two, or to lose two, three million people. We have two, you know, we, we uh, fulfill two different things. One, less people to feed. And two, the rest will be really terrified. So there were all blood. They would not stand. You know, think a second to kill the closest people to them. Stalin's wife, by the way, Svetlana, uh, 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 Svetlana is his daughter, Aleluyeva, she committed suicide. And the number of suicides were so high, not just among people because there were no choices, among the writers and poets and, and artists because they see what they did. What have we done that was some of the people that would look and, and really see the reality. What are they doing? They're killing their own brothers and sisters. Again, did I answer the question? I did. Um, yes, hi, I'm Ezra Smogard from San Diego High School. And I'm, I have a question for both of you. Did like, they ever try to go and like go after you, try to look for you? after you, like, you left? Um, you know, for me, because I was not in Cambodia or left like Cambodia, right? So there's no way that they look for me because I'm already here or in the refugee camp and in the state. So they, not, they did not, you know, uh, come and look for us. But um, during the communists took over in Cambodia, you know, um, at the time, like some people try to leave the country, try to escape. If one escape, they will kill the whole family. Do I answer your question? <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think anybody came and looked for us. If they would, they would probably be greeted with tea and cookies. I don't know. But uh, my husband worked in... Um, uh, plant where they were building the planes. So the CIA were very interested in him and then came to visit us, which I didn't know what CIA meant. And when they left, my husband said, do you know who that was? I said, no, but I offered them tea and cookie and you know, so I'm very hospitable. <laughs> We have time for one final question, and if you don't mind, I'm actually going to ask it. Uh, my name is Madison Haversetzer, and um, 
Of course, here at the Reagan Ranch, Ronald Reagan is a really important figure to us. And we know that he um, is a hero really around the world um, in many ways, especially for his strong stance against communism. Uh, Marina, I'd be really curious to hear um, your perspective on President Reagan um, and uh, what how he's received in now the former Soviet Union. Uh, is he talked about? Is he someone that's important? Um, and why should we remember him and his relation to communism? Uh, when we came here, the president was Harold Ford. Um, so President Reagan is my hero simply because I saw what he was doing. And when we came, we actually we voted Democratic because it's Democrat, it's democracy. So we didn't know. And um, then, you know, we've learned, and Reagan was the first conservative president that we voted for. And I've studied a lot about him. And when I saw his speech, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down that wall that did it, I am just so elated. I can't believe that the tour yesterday that I took, I actually got to see where he walked, where he worked, where he was signing the documents. It is going to stay for me for the rest of my life. And I think I really, really would like to bring my husband here because he knows more. He retains numbers and dates. I don't. Um, I retain feelings and uh, faces. But thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mrs. Ath and Mrs. Davidovich, for being with us today. Students, let's give them one more thank you, please. We're now going to take a break for lunch. Uh, we are going to reconvene for a group picture in about an hour, uh, but right now you're welcome to head on up to the rooftop and also make sure to take some time to explore our exhibit galleries if you haven't. Uh, the galleries will be open throughout lunch, so make sure to stop by. Thank you.